Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the Columbia Climate School Summer 2024 Pre-College Programs Info Session. Um, today, we are going to learn all about the program that we have for high school students that's being offered by the Columbia Climate School and Putney Student Travel. Before we start, I would love to introduce everyone that's joining us today. Um, today, we have Governor Peter Shumlin, the 81st Governor of Vermont from 2011 to 2017 and co-director of Putney Student Travel. On the Columbia side, we have Miriam Nelson, a doctoral student in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at Columbia University and NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies. Um, I, my name is Laurel Daimashihi. I am at the Columbia Climate School. Um, I have experience in um, high school and pre-college educational programs, and I run the NOD group programs at the Climate School. And Evan Overton will also be joining us today from Putney Student Travel. Um, at Putney, Evan collaborates with us to run the Columbia Climate School in the Green Mountains program, and he also manages the applications and scholarships. So for the agenda for today's informational session, um, we're going to start with a brief introduction of the organizations that are behind this effort, the Columbia Climate School and Putney Student Travel. And more specifically, we're going to dive into what it's going to be like to be part of the Columbia Climate School in the Green Mountains program in summer 2024. We're gonna conclude about sharing about program eligibility, the scholarship and application process and any next steps that you might wanna to take to be part of our program. Um, we have a Q&A button for you all to um, ask questions at any point during the program. So feel free to pop in those questions as soon as you think of them and we'll be sure to save time at the end to answer all of your questions, um, either live or we'll type them out for you. Um, Perfect. So um, as a little introduction to the Columbia Climate School, um, the Columbia Climate School at Columbia University is a transdisciplinary climate research center and school. It was announced in July 2020, and the climate school is the first new school to be established at the university in over 25 years. The Columbia Climate School's mission is to develop and inspire knowledge-based solutions and to educate future leaders for just and prosperous societies on a healthy planet. Um, the climate school was really born out of the recognition that Climate change is one of society's greatest challenges and an intergenerational human rights concern that it will disproportionately impact people that are already severely disadvantaged. And these challenges are complex and they're difficult and they require innovative and coordinated and transdisciplinary approaches and solutions. So the Climate School addresses these challenges as it's guided by interdisciplinary research, partnerships, education, innovative technologies, and the sharing of ideas with a focus on having a direct impact on the world. Columbia University is a global leader in climate and sustainability education and has a long-standing history of earth and environmental science research and education. Our true beginning reside, resides with the founding of Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory over 70 years ago. Located 20 miles north of New York City on 189 acres, LDEO is the number one ranked scientific institution in the US devoted to earth and environmental sciences. Columbia University's Lamont's research has been instrumental in the topic of climate change. In fact, the term global warming was first coined by Dr. Wallace Broker in 1972. Dr. Broker was a scientist at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory and a professor of geology in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at Columbia University. Lamont's research also includes the development of the first model to accurately predict the extreme weather associated with an El Nino event. And this just scratches the surface on some of the earth and climate discoveries that have been generated by Lamont. Um, in addition, the Earth Institute was started in 1996. It's the largest research institute at Columbia University with over 750 environmental scientists, managers, policy analysts, engineers, and other experts. The Earth Institute was the architect behind many of our programs today at the Climate School. EI was established about 25 years ago in response to the no notion that sustainability issues of climate, natural hazards, and the relationship between human society and the environment 
all needed evidence and research-driven solutions. EI houses a couple dozen research centers, and this includes the International Research Institute for Climate and Society, or IRI, and the Center for International Research, uh, excuse me, International um, Earth Science Information Network, or CSEN. The Climate School is committed to offering multidisciplinary educational opportunities for graduate, undergraduate, and pre-college students, as they are the next generation of change makers and are essential stakeholders to addressing the climate crisis. So why are young people so critical? Well, climate is a long-term problem. We're experiencing the challenges now, but the next generation are gonna be the most affected. So young people need to be part of the solution in developing new climate technologies, ways to clim combat climate injustices, and new adaptation approaches to climate impacts. And how are we going to do that? Young people need to be equipped with the knowledge, skills, and tools to drive solutions. And it's not that we need everyone to be a climate scientist. We need a diversity of skills, passions, and careers with climate science serving as the underpinning of their work. So our pre-college programs demonstrate how we can bring earth processes, climate science, and sustainability into everything that you might want to pursue as a career. Whether you do want to be a climate scientist, or maybe a lawyer, or a politician, an artist, a doctor, or a professional in any other sector, Climate will have an impact on you and your work, but you can be a part of the solution. A core piece of all of our pre-college programs is developing young people into community leaders. Much of the work happens at a local level, so we need climate activists to mobilize communities and drive change. Our partnership with Putney Student Travel allows us to offer an unparalleled summer experience for students to go into the field and on the ground with Columbia Climate School experts to become immersed in climate content that high schoolers just don't normally have access to. Um, today, we are um, really excited to be honored or we're excited to be joined by both Governor Peter Shumlin and Evan Overton from Putney Student Travel. So I'm going to pass it off to them to give a little bit of a history of Putney. Thanks everyone, thank you, Laurel. We really appreciate you all for attending and I'm glad to be able to introduce Putney Student Travel, a family-run educational organization going into our 73rd summer. And our mission is to change students' lives through travel. We offer high school and middle school programs around the world, many of which are small group traveling programs focused on exploration, language learning, service work, and career themes. And these programs really aim to get students out into the world, interacting with each other and local communities, learning skills and knowledge that they can use in their futures. Um, we are now an organization in our third generation and very proud to be woman owned and also proud of this unique collaboration we're offering with Columbia University's Climate School, the Columbia Climate School in the Green Mountains, which is really bringing together the climate science expertise of this world-renowned academic institution with our educational organization's best practices working with teenagers. Um, we're thrilled to have joining us today the 81st governor of Vermont, Peter Shumlin, who I am going to pass it over to now to tell you a bit more about the history of Putney Student Travel, and then I'll be back a little bit later to discuss the application process. Thank you. Well, thank you, Evan, and thank you, Laurel, for that great introduction to the Climate School at Columbia University. I've got to say, before I talk a little about the program, that one of the joys of my summer, the great joys, is being with Laurel and people like Miriam, who you're going to hear from shortly, here in Vermont, uh, and the extraordinary professors from the Columbia Climate School, where we select, or they select together, I guess we select, uh, the most extraordinary group of, of really motivated young students who are, in my view, our hope for the future. And it really is, I always go up uh, several times, including I've had the pleasure for the last few years of being the, the, the keynote speaker on the final evening. And uh, the tears, the joy, but most importantly, the commitment and the compassion is what gives me hope uh, for this planet going forward. So thank you to Columbia University and to the Climate School for making this happen. How did we get involved? Uh, there you see my parents, George and Kitty Shumlin, uh, who were educators, high school teachers, a result of the World War II war. My dad was the generation where you were sent off to 
fight the battle at age 17, and that's how you grew up. Uh, my mom grew up in occupied Holland. Uh, she wasn't Jewish, but when she'd be playing with her Jewish friends in the morning, they'd be gone the next day. So you can imagine how the war impacted everything that they did. And they were high school teachers who wanted to turn summer vacation into education. But remember, there were no commercial aircraft then to speak of. If you were going to send your student off to do work around the world, it was by ship. And it was a very different world. But they really transformed what we called then summer vacation into summer education. And when the Columbia Climate School approached us to help collaborate on this project, it was one of the most exciting things that we could get involved with and remains so. So we're really uh, uh, fortunate to be here. So the next slide, I'll tell you a little bit about my commitment to renewable energy and how I got involved. As you know, Vermont's a small rural state. Uh, back when, to put it in historic perspective, when uh, uh, Barack Obama was running against John McCain for president of the United States, you may recall in those years that we were in a worldwide recession. The world was less partisan than it is today, less divided. And every candidate, whether you were Republican or Democrat, were running on the theme of jobs. We were in a terrible recession. Uh, the banks had practically collapsed. We bailed them out, as you may recall. And things were all about jobs. I ran for governor uh, as a Democrat in a five-way Democratic primary. And one of the things that was in my platform in that primary was energy and how we could rethink the way we do energy to create jobs in this small state. And I really said uh, a few things to voters. I said, if you elect me, we're going to move from fossil fuels to renewable energy. And when we do that, and energy efficiency, when we do that, use less juice and use cleaner juice, it's my belief that we're going to create jobs because whenever you transform an economy from one way of doing things to another, you create tons of jobs. I said, second, I think we'll put money in Vermonters pockets because I firmly believe, regardless of what the status quo tells us today, that it is cheaper to build out solar and wind than it is to import oil and coal from states and countries, countries that often don't like us much anyway. And so I said, we'll put money in your pockets because electric bills will go down. We will create jobs. And third, we can show the rest of America how a small state can move to a green, clean, renewable energy future. So I went around to, uh, in Vermont, you do it this way, small stores and shops. That's in St. Albans, Vermont, in the Northeast Kingdom. And I spread the word about what I believed. I won the primary. My Republican opponent said exactly what you would expect a Republican opponent to say, and it's not much different today. He said, don't listen to this guy. Uh, first of all, climate change is fooey hooey, so don't pay attention to that talk. And secondly, he's going to take money from your pockets, not put money in your pockets, because electric rates are going to go up. We all know that renewable energy is much more expensive than fossil fuels. And furthermore, he'll kill jobs because he's going to shut down the current generating power systems that we have in this state, not create jobs. Anyway, long and short of it is, without getting too much into details, I don't want to take too much time, uh, I won that election. And if you shoot to the next slide, the first thing that I did was to sign into law a comprehensive energy plan for Vermont that gave us the tools to implement the policies that I'd outlined in that campaign. Without going into too much detail, I can tell you that after three terms as governor of this little state, we delivered on the promise. We became the number one solar state in America, according to the Union of Concerned Scientists. And remember, Vermont is hardly a tropical state, but we became the number one solar state in America. We increased solar by four times. We increased our wind generation by 11 times, and we created thousands and thousands of jobs. In fact, by the last my last year's governor, if you had 16 Vermonters in a room, one of them was working in renewable energy business. So we had an explosion of businesses around the state that moved to this new way of harnessing power and harnessing our future. So we created jobs. Our electric rates went down. Now, a smart economist at Columbia or, any, or anywhere else would say, well, check with that 
politician says, did all of the rates around his little state go up or down? And the answer is yes, they went up. New Hampshire went up as much as 50% in some regions of the state, 100% in others. Uh, Massachusetts saw drastic increases. Connecticut, uh, Governor Malloy was dealing with huge increases there. And New York saw big increases. So we were in an unusual situation where renewables and our move to energy efficiency actually put money back in Vermonters' pockets. The electric bill would come, rates would be lower than the month before. And third, we did show how a little state could help to reduce our carbon footprint. So why is this all relevant to this conversation today about the, this summer in Vermont? Because Columbia, the climate school came to us and said, wouldn't Vermont be a fantastic laboratory as we bring our professors, as we bring our expertise, as we bring our scientists to these young activists to be able to fan right out after they get this information from us and go and actually see how you link public policy, the mission, with outcomes that actually make a difference to give us some hope. So that's what this program really does. It's centered in Vermont, not New York, because we use Vermont as the laboratory. It's a small state. We do things like make a journey to Burlington Electric. It's the only, that I know of, the only uh, utility that's owned by the city, owned by the taxpayers of the city of Burlington. It is now run by my former chief of staff, Darren Springer, who invites all the students in to understand how it works, the economics of it, what it means for carbon emissions to have the largest city in the state have zero emissions in their electric grid. So we make lots of journeys into the depths of Vermont to understand how the goals can easily be matched with policymakers that then results in lower carbon footprint and therefore hope for the future. So I want to turn it back over to Laurel and Evan and the rest of the team. But I just want to say this, uh, of all of the work that I did as governor, and being a governor is one of the great jobs in this world because you can really make a difference. Uh, of all of the work that I did, this was, in my view, the most important work that our team did. Because we know that we're losing the battle. We know that the clock is ticking. We know that we're out of time. And we know that the only hope we have is frankly to reach in to the brains and minds of young committed people, meaning somewhere between 12 and 17, and get them the tools that they need, desire, and dream of to help us win the biggest battle that humanity has faced thus far, as far as I'm concerned. So am I passionate about this one? You bet. Am I super excited about this summer at Columbia? You bet. I hope you'll join us and uh, we'll get you through the admissions process and hopefully see you in Vermont this summer. Thanks for having me. And Laurel, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, your keynote speech at the end of the program is always a highlight for our entire student group. And um, we, I think you said it perfectly. Vermont is the perfect classroom, the perfect laboratory for this program to be run. So we are extremely excited as well. Thanks, Laura. All right, so now to share a little bit more about the Columbia Climate School in the Green Mountains program. It is based at Vermont State University's picturesque 165 acre campus. Students of the Green Mountains program will be joining a cohort of like-minded students from across the country and the world. We had quite a few international students joining us last year to learn from each other, to collaborate, and to gain an understanding of the multifaceted aspects of climate change, to learn about individual roles in climate action, and to engage in meaningful conversation about taking action in your own communities. The, this is the fourth year that we've been running the Columbia Climate School in the Green Mountains program. Um, the dates for summer 2024 are June 30th through July 12th, uh, 2024. So it's a 13 day, 12 night program. The fee is $6,790, and this is an all-inclusive fee that covers your accommodation, your meals, your uh, program activities, field excursions, and weekend trips, and transportation during the program. These pre-college programs are really designed for high school students, grades 9 through 12, as well as rising ninth grade students. 
Um, and now I want to share a brief video from the summer 2021 so you can hear directly from the Columbia Climate School experts and the Green Mountain students. Climate is a problem that affects all of us globally and locally. You guys, sometimes you might look at something and be like, there's nothing there. Look hard. At the Columbia Climate School, we are extremely passionate about education and we are very interested in preparing our future generations uh, to face the impacts and have a much better understanding of the science behind climate change so that they can take action. It's one thing to be teaching in a classroom, but when you're teaching about climate, there's nothing that's better than being out in the field. Climate change is so important to me, mostly because of where I'm from and the culture there. Um, to elaborate on because where I'm from, um, South Texas has wonderful and beautiful beaches and marine life and natural life. And climate change threatens that on so many levels. The most interesting thing that I've learned is that when dealing with big issues like climate change, you have to think in terms of these systems. So not just focusing on one problem, but looking at how that one problem interacts with all the other problems so important for young people to get involved in the climate problem and finding climate solutions. This program has motivated me to want to help my local like environmental organizations um, and just offer knowledge that maybe people in my community don't have the access to. These teenagers are curious, energetic, quite activated uh, by this issue. Some of the ideas that they've had have been uh, something that uh, we've learned a lot from and are really planning to incorporate into our work as well. It's just a perfect opportunity for them to start their climate journeys and to go back to their own communities and take action. All right, so hopefully that gives you a little taste of what it would be like to be part of the Columbia Climate School in the Green Mountains program. And I've been fortunate enough to be a part of the program since its inception in 2021. And I have found that each year, my favorite part of the program is the bi-directional learning that happens. Everyone in the program is coming from a different background with different passions, different skills. And it provides this incredible opportunity for mentorship and learning across many different relationships. As you heard Tom Chandler mention, they have even incorporated some of the students' input into their own work. So students are learning from the mentors, mentors are learning from the students, and students are learning from each other. And as we as we head toward the end of the program, it's always incredible to see the growth of knowledge and confidence that students gain. And this is particularly evident in their final presentations of their climate action plans, which is a critical component of this whole experience. And we'll touch on that in a little bit. We place a strong emphasis on academics in our pre-college programs overall. Each summer, the program content varies based on the feedback that we receive from the past participants. So this summer, the themes are the science of climate change. This will touch on natural variability versus anthropogenic or human-caused climate change, climate projections and modeling, climate information and decision-making. We also will go into climate impacts and resilience. We will discuss global processes and local impacts, preparedness and risk, recovery and planning, mitigation and adaptation. We'll also talk about international climate policies and negotiations. Um, during these discussions, we'll talk about 
the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement, decarbonization pathways and the energy transition, monitoring and measuring progress, United Nations climate change conferences, and global governance and international law. We also will talk about sustainability and circular economy. So we'll talk about the consumerism and throwaway culture, how to build a value chain, new economic models and circular systems, and achieve, achieving sustainable business practices. And finally, we'll talk about um, community engagement, climate action, and advocacy. Um, these lessons really focus on um, first learning about local community impacts and then developing plans um, led by the students to address these challenges, whether it be through climate mitigation or adaptation, students develop these different solutions with the goal of bringing them back to their community. And um, the Columbia Climate School Act experts help them along every step of the way in that planning process. In 2024, we have six Columbia Climate School experts that are going to be leading the lessons and activities for the Green Mountains program. The experts of the program are leaders in a variety of sectors, including climate science, social science, sustainability, finance, and policy. Um, we are all committed to equipping students with the tools that they need to take action for global climate impact. Our first expert is Laurel DeSera. Laurel is a doctoral student at the International Research Institute for Climate Society. Her research focuses on how mosquito-borne diseases are impacted by climate. She um, focuses on assessing and improving sub-seasonal to seasonal forecasts and how these models can be used by decision makers to improve the livelihood of their constituents. Laurel co-teaches the climate science primer lesson and teaches the science of climate change lesson. Our next expert is Miriam Nelson, and Miriam's actually here with us today, so I'll let Miriam introduce herself and share a little bit about her research. Hi, everyone. So, yeah, I'm uh, Miriam, and as you can read on this slide, I'm a PhD student in Earth and Environmental Sciences at Columbia University, and I also work at NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies. My research is on hydroclimate extremes in modern and future climates, uh, which basically means I use observations and climate models to try to figure out how climate change is impacting extreme precipitation and droughts. Uh, and so I co-teach the climate science primer with Laurel, and I also teach the climate modeling and forecasting lecture. Awesome. Thanks, Miriam. And we're going to have a chance to hear a little bit more about what the climate science primer looks like in just a moment. Um, our next expert is Josh DeVincenzo from the National Center for Disaster Preparedness. Josh focuses on developing learning experiences associated with FEMA training projects that navigate housing and economic recovery. Josh teaches the climate change communication, climate change conversation, and preparedness tools and strategies lessons. Martin Dietrich Brauch is um, a lead researcher at the Columbia Center on Sustainable Investment. Martin leads economic and legal research training and advisory work with a focus on legal and policy frameworks and practices for sustainable investment to achieve climate change mitigation and adaptation goals. These goals include decarbonization and a just transition to net zero emissions, energy systems and economies and other sustainable development goals. Martin teaches the sustainable development goals in Paris Agreement lesson, decarbonization pathways, monitoring and measuring progress, global governance, and international law lessons. Um, Martin also um, will be able to join us for our climate negotiations activity this year, which will be really exciting to have his input on that as well. Sandra Goldmark is an associate professor of professional practice at the Department of Theater at Barnard College and the director of campus sustainability and climate action at Barnard um, and has a dual role at the Climate School in broader in, um, external engagement. Um, she's the founder of Fix Up, which uses a multidisciplinary approach to focus on creating innovative solutions to use and discard culture by helping people care for what they have, reduce waste from new manufacturing, and create local jobs. So Sandra has a really interesting background. Um, as you just heard, she started in theater, um, but really has transitioned into the sustainability and circular economy space. So um, Sandra will be joining us for one of our info sessions. Be sure to join to hear a little bit more about her pathway as well. Um, Sandra teaches the introduction to circular, circular economy from circular 
from linear to circular activity and connections to circularity lessons. And um, I will also be joining the program again this year. Um, I have a background in marine science and biology and sustainability science. Um, so I will be um, teaching and working with you all on developing your climate action plans. And I will be going over the various climate impacts that are experienced um, in your communities all over the world. Um, I have quite a bit of experience working with students um, and leading in field-based activities. So given my marine science background and my experience um, leading in field research, we are going to get out in the beautiful landscape of Vermont and do some sampling, um, analyze some of the um, samples that we collect. And um, I'll share a little bit more about that in, in later slides. But in the classroom, I teach climate change in your community, climate activism, and empowering youth for change. In addition to the academic rigor that we ensure, we also make sure that students have fun and are given opportunities to um, explore all that Vermont has to offer. Um, there are a variety of purposeful activities and immersive experiences that students can participate in throughout the program and different learning modalities. Um, so it's not all lecture based. We do have a speaker series, um, but we also have team building and networking activities, excursions and field based lessons, small group workshops, um, activities to explore Vermont and a final climate action project where students develop a solution or a plan to address one climate challenge that their community faces. Students will then be given the opportunity to share their final projects in short presentations to Columbia Climate School experts to get feedback um, to ultimately develop this project once they go home to drive real change in their community. All right, so I'm gonna ask Miriam to come back and share a little bit about the climate science primer. We wanted to give you a little sneak peek at some of the program content, lessons and activities that you can expect as part of the Green Mountains program. And we always start the program with a climate science primer, um, just because there are no prerequisites or courses that students have to take to be accepted into the program. So this primer is um, a great lesson that allows all students to start with the foundational knowledge that they need to build on throughout the program. Yeah, I mean, exactly what Laurel said. It's all about getting everyone up to the same kind of level playing field. Uh, so we understand all the same kind of jargony terms. Um, but some of the things we talk about uh, that are listed on the slide, but we also kind of we define what actually is climate. What does climate change mean? How do we know that the climate is changing and who's causing it? Um, we also talk about climate variability and uncertainty. So what's changing the natural system and how much of that do we actually know? What, is, what does uncertainty even mean? Um, we also have a, a little section on how earth scientists find and collect data, which we then use to inform our analyses, um, but also why sometimes collecting that data and getting good data is really hard um, and some of the difficulties behind that. Uh, and then we also get into a little bit of the physics behind our planet's atmosphere. Uh, we're not going to make you do any equations or anything, uh, but get a kind of real feel understanding of what it means uh, to you know what is what is happening in the Earth's atmosphere when all this incoming solar radiation is happening, uh, and what a greenhouse is, gas is actually doing. Um, and I think that there's a, a short video on this slide that we kind of had a, a physical embodiment of you know Earth's rate of balance in greenhouse gases. Which, out of context, uh, maybe doesn't exactly explain what a photon is doing, um, but it was, uh, it makes a lot more sense when you're there. Uh, and so I hope you'll join us for it. Hi, so sorry about that. Hopefully everyone didn't get um, kicked out. Um, Miriam, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. I, I, I basically, I said my spiel, though I'm happy to talk more about it in the Q&A if people have questions. <laughs> 
Perfect. Okay. So sorry. I got kicked out of Zoom for some reason. So I wasn't sure where we landed. Um, amazing. So that's just a little taste of one of the lessons that Miriam leads. Um, but as she mentioned, she also leads the uh, climate modeling and projections lesson. So um, lots, lots of fun and learning that happens um, in the right off the bat in the first couple of days of the program. Okay. The next little teaser that I wanted to share with you is a lesson that's led by Josh J. Vincenzo called Preparedness Tools and Strategies. This is really more of an activity um, because Josh works with um, FEMA-led projects. Um, this is a fast-paced simulation that facilitates an understanding of the emergency notification process of a county government during or after the remnants of a major natural or unnatural disaster. So it really is I, I spoke to Josh about this activity and he said, this is a real life scenario that happens at a government call center. So students are actually experiencing the challenges that might be encountered after let's say um, a hurricane or a tornado or a major flood. And they're forced to think collaboratively and think through the solutions together in a time. So there's a lot of um, noises that are put on to simulate that you're in a call center. There's a clock that's ticking down. So there's a little bit of pressure there, but that's that's kind of the the what happens in real life. So this is just a little video to give you a taste of what this activity is like as well. Don't touch the water, don't bring the water, don't drink the water, don't use the water, don't bathe. So those are two student groups that are, they need to collaborate on one common goal. And it sounds like it's related to resources such as water. <laughs> the next lesson is decarbonization pathways. This is one of the lessons led by Martin Dietrich Brauch. Um, he shares about a broad range of policy approaches and technologies that are needed for the rapid reduction of CO2, which are including, but not limited to, energy efficiency, behavioral changes, electrification, renewables, hydrogen and hydrogen-based fuel, bioenergy, carbon capture use and storage. Um, there is a statement that was um, shared by the UN Environment Emissions Gap Report in 2020 that says, the emissions of the richest 1% of global populations account for more than twice the combined shared of the poorest 50%. So it's very clear that high income or emerging economies from the Americas, Asia, Europe, they have the greatest share of historical emissions and therefore should take on the largest responsibility um, as it relates to climate mitigation. And so uh, Martin's lessons really take a deep dive into that, including global governance and international policy and law. Um, I briefly mentioned that Martin's going to be joining us for the climate negotiations activity. This is a huge half day activity where all the students in the program, they come together in this role playing game that's premised on the International Climate Summit. So students um, in groups, they role play different delegates representing a specific nation or a negotiating block or in some case interest groups. And everyone has to work together to reach a global agreement that successfully keeps climate change well below two degrees C and aims to stay within 1.5 degrees C. So that's the goal. You can see that after each negotiation round, we plug in the data to see where we're at in terms of our projections. Sometimes you got to go back to the drawing board and renegotiate. So it's really another um, activity that simulates a real life um challenge in, in getting to our goal. Um, it really exposes students to understand these international negotiations and what the conversations are at these international conferences and how to drive solutions. Um, the circular economy lessons, the three lessons that are led by Sandra Goldmark, they present the core concepts of circular economy. And then through a group activity, students work together to critically think and strategically implement a system or a product that's currently linear and develop a circular system around it. So um, students have gotten really creative with this um, and then they present their new circular systems for the class um, for feedback and input. Um, people, again, really creative. There is one group that thought about, you know, chicken packaging. 
that is a very linear system. It has bacteria involved. So how can we create chicken packaging, something that's circular? So lots of creative thinking as well. Um, but this is um, always a really favorited um, series of lessons by student groups. Um, and I also mentioned that we have a variety of field-based activities that allow students to gain technical and research-based skills, excuse me, um, uh, through field data collection and analysis. So students um, do not engage in their own formal research project. I do want to just be clear that this program is not a research-based program, and that's because of time constraints, um, but these research-based activities provide students with a unique sampling field experience and an opportunity to apply skills and data analysis that will be critical for their college careers, especially if they're um, focusing on a STEM career. These activities also provide a day-in-the-life snapshot of a biologist, a climatologist, an earth scientist, etc. So we do a variety of different field activities. This is one of them where um, students are sampling macroinvertebrates, which are these tiny little aquatic bugs that start their life in the water and then um, metamorphosis into a flying or land insect. Um, but these tiny aquatic bugs in this stage of their life are really great indicators of water quality because some are very sensitive and cannot survive in polluted or water with low oxygen. So they are what we call a proxy for um identifying what the water quality is like in an area. Um, we'll also travel to Lake Bomacine, which is just down the road from our campus to survey fish, aquatic animals, conduct water chemistry tests, and do some sediment coring. So um, climate has local impacts, as you know, or you may not know, but you will learn. <laughs> and these can be assessed through long-term data analysis. So while this is a one-day sampling session, you're contributing to an annual database um, that has been taken year after year in this program. So we can also analyze the water through the species that we catch, similar to the macro invertebrates. If there is a really sensitive species that we catch in the water, it might indicate that we have um, good water quality, but we can check that with our water chemistry tests, such as pH, dissolved oxygen, um, how oxygen relates to temperature, et cetera, et cetera. Sediment coring in this context will tell us about the speed of the water, um, but sediment coring globally in a um, earth science research context, they take sediment cores that are extremely long out of the ocean and they actually are a proxy for past climate. So we'll talk about um, how, how that works, um, the science behind that, and while our little sediment cores can't tell us about a long climate record, we can kind of share about the, the anatomy of a sediment core and how a climate scientist might do that. We are going to look at tree rings. Um, tree rings can tell us a lot about climate, and there's an entire research group at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory that is actually focused on dendrochronology. So students are able to take a tiny core out of a tree. It doesn't harm the tree at all, but it does allow us to see the tree rings, and that can tell us about past climate, whether it was good growing season, potentially lots of water with um, favorable conditions or a poor growing season that would result in a really thin ring. So we'll collect our tree rings and then analyze them back in the lab. Um, and this was a, a really fun activity that students really enjoyed as well. Field excursions are a critical part of this program. Um, we take a day and spend it at Burlington, Vermont. Um, we can hear from a panel of sector experts that are implementing sustainability into their work. We also visit Burlington Electric um, Utility Company's plant. Burlington was one of the first cities to go 100% to, um, sorry, source 100% of their electricity to, from renewable sources. So it's really amazing opportunity to hear about how Burlington Electric achieved this ambition ambitious goal, and also about how they have um, community-based educational opportunities that help residents with energy savings. So um, really great opportunity to learn from sector professionals. And then we have fun. We get to explore downtown Burlington. Um, the group last year even went to a the local Lake Monsters baseball game. It's, it's a really great day. 
We also had an excursion to Lake George to visit the Darren Freshwater Institute. Um, this was a really wonderful opportunity for students to learn about some of those local climate impacts in Vermont, particularly how climate is impacting Lake George and the aquatic environment and some of the tools and technologies that they are currently using to monitor these changes. Um, they have been a really great partner and we might even be able to sample in Lake George and compare our findings to what we had found at Lake Bomasine. So um, that is a really exciting new addition to the program this year. Um, as I mentioned, we're also in Vermont and Vermont has a lot of incredible things to offer and we want students to embrace all these opportunities as well. So we will go hiking, berry picking. Um, there's a alpaca farm that we get to visit and we'll even get to visit a sustainable or regenerative agricultural farm as well. Um, Project-based learning is a really critical way for students to apply their new knowledge and skills into a um, project that's going to drive real change into their community. So it's really important that um, every student completes their own climate action project or a CAP. Um, these CAPs will address one climate challenge that their community faces, and these solutions can be climate adaptation or mitigation focused. Um, students will have the opportunity to present their pr presentations in a formal um, presentation to the group. And then we'll also have a poster presentation where all the students get to walk around and see the uh, projects that were developed by their peers. We've really had a diversity of different projects over the years. Some folks um, have focused on wetland restoration and education, which is actually a project that's now implemented in a school in, the, um, in Texas, which is pretty amazing to see climate action project developed from the Green Mountains um, in action in real life. Um, we had one student that was looking at decarbonizing her school's website by using intentional coding and design to reduce the amount of energy used on a website, which is so incredible. Um, so another student developed a bilingual educational children's book. Someone else wanted to implement and has a plan to put solar panels on their school's building. So these projects, um, they are varied in topic. They're varied in um, what your community looks like, whether it's your school community or your town. Um, but we are here to help you every step of the way in the development of your CAP. And then we celebrate at the end of the program with a nice dinner and a keynote speech from um, Governor Pete Shumlin. So that's always a really um, incredible highlight of the program. All right, so I do wanna mention that you might be familiar with our Columbia Climate Corps traveling programs. Um, these are programs that we ran in summer 2022 and 2023 to Iceland, Chile, and Argentina, and Alaska. Unfortunately, we will no longer be offering these programs. Um, however, if you are specifically interested in a traveling program that focuses on climate, I suggest you look at Putney's website because they have a lot of opportunities in these areas. Um, but the only Columbia Climate School program is the Columbia Climate School and the Green Mountains program for summer 2024. All right, so now I want to hand it over to Evan to share a little bit about program eligibility, applications, and next steps. Laurel, so our program is open to students in grades 9 through 12, and we do also consider rising freshmen or students who are currently in 8th grade completing 8th grade prior to this summer. It is a selective admissions process. It's not meant to be a, a super difficult process, like let's say applying to an Ivy League institution might be, but it is an admissions-based process where we're looking for students who are really passionate about climate science, who really wanna make change. And um, we do require two teacher references along with the student's applicant statement um, prior to accepting any student. It is a rolling applications process. So there's not a specific due date but March 15th is an important date in our timeline, and I'll discuss that in just a moment. Um, in order to apply, students visit the website, and you'll see a, a button to apply now, which starts with the family creating a family profile. So the contact information, the basic contact details for at least one parent or guardian needs to be input. A secondary parent's contact information can be input, and once the family profile is created, then the family creates a profile for their individual student applicant. 
Um, once that step is made, the family has to put down a $700 payment to hold space for their student before the rest of the application opens for them to complete their applicant statement and input the contact information for the two teachers who will serve as their educator references. That's just the name and the email of those two teachers. And then eventually um, families and students will sign an agreement form. But again, the $700 payment to hold space is composed of a $200 non-refundable application fee and a $500 deposit to the program fee, which is refundable up to that date of March the 15th. So if a family decides to change summer plans or for whatever reason maybe has to withdraw prior to that date, um, 500 of that $700 payment is returned. Um, for students who are enrolled in the program, that March 15th date is the date that the final balance on program fee is due. Any students who apply and are not accepted to the program, that $700 payment is returned in full to the family. If you have any questions about our application process, you are welcome to give us a call at 802-387-5000. We'd be happy to talk about the application process, um, the Columbia Climate School and the Green Mountains program, and you know any of these nuances. But we try to make it a pretty simple application process. Again, it starts with that $700 payment to hold space, being that this is a competitive application, and we want to make sure that you know students who are interested have that ability to hold space while they complete the rest of the application process. And we do also offer scholarships for the Columbia Climate School in the Green Mountains. You can go to the same website to learn about that. It is a different application process in that students apply via a Google form, which is more or less identical to our regular application, but it is a separate application process to apply for a scholarship. Scholarships are financial need based and you can learn more about the eligibility guidelines on the website. In order to um, be eligible for a scholarship, students do need to reside in the US, meet the general eligibility guidelines for the program, and demonstrate the financial need in the guidelines by submitting a um, financial verification form, typically a tax document from their parent or guardian's um, prior year submission. The deadline for the scholarship is March the 15th, 2024. And if you are um, interested, we encourage you to apply. Uh, please share out the opportunity with any students who might qualify and be interested. And if you have any questions about the scholarship in particular, I encourage you to give us a call at the number on the previous slide, our GoPutney number, or email scholarships at goputney.com, and we'll do our best to answer any inquiries as soon as possible. Well, I think that is the, the, the main um, information regarding how to apply. There are a few website addresses and emails up on the screen now to jot down. And we definitely encourage any families or students with more questions to give us a call. We love to uh, chat with families and make sure you feel fully informed about the program. Thank you, Laurel, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you so much, Evan. Thank you so much, everyone, um, for spending the last hour with us. Um, we do have time for questions. So just um, as a reminder, if you have any questions, feel free to use the Q&A button and we'd be happy to answer them live. Um, we did have a question that was asking a little bit earlier about some of the hands-on learning opportunities in this program. Um, as you saw, we have lots of field-based activities, um, we have excursions, we have activities that are led by the experts that are related to their lessons. So we really focus on um, a variety of learning modalities. Um, this is a pre-college program, so we want students to um, use this opportunity as a way to prepare for college. So we will be staying at a college campus. We will be in dorms, we will be eating in the dining hall, we will be in lecture hall. So you will have that experience, but this is a summer program and we we personally at the climate school we feel that students learn best through experiences and hands-on learning and field experiences in particular so um, we've been in been sure to really embed those different um, opportunities throughout the program um i also just want to as we're waiting for any questions to pop in um 
that um, there is a cap on this program of 100 students and we do accept applications on a rolling basis. So um, if you know you want to join us this summer, um, we encourage you to put in your application sooner than later. And if you reach out to us at these emails, we'd be happy to help you throughout that um, application process if you have any questions. And there are no prerequisites, again, um, that everything that you need to develop your climate action plan, um, all the skills, the knowledge, the tools will be delivered in this two-week program. So you can come at any point in your climate journey. All right, well, I'm, I'm seeing no questions at the moment. Um, so we will, whoop, there we go. Sorry, I keep, um, click, click the wrong button. Um, thank you again for joining us and um, we hope to see you this summer. Bye everyone.